Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. And um, thank you, gentlemen, for coming tonight, too. Um, and I just thought we would kick off the questions um, with the idea of where the idea came from for boyhood. Oh, gosh. The big question. Um, I think I've been a father for about six or seven years. And, you know, having a kid, you just sort of have to relive your own childhood a little bit. And as a filmmaker, I'm always thinking, is that a movie? Can I make a movie about that? So it was really about um, wanting to explore childhood in a movie, you know, narrative. And I guess I thought about it for a couple of years and couldn't really crack the story because if you think about it, most films about kids, are they cover like that special weekend or that you know, one moment of that summer because you've got this limitation with the actor's you know, physicality. You can't ask a seven-year-old to, oh, now you're 10. You know, I realized I didn't have that one moment. I wanted to express the whole, what it feels like to just grow up and all that, all that territory. And so I've kind of given up on the idea. And then, and then it hit me, like, well, if we film a little bit, you know, I think I found the form to tell what I was trying to express. And time seems very much something you've played with throughout your career, like in Waking yeah. Life or in Dazed and Confused. It was the last day of high yeah. school and in the Before series. So it's, is that sort of one of your tropes? I guess obviously yeah, it would be. Yeah, I've had to think about it, especially the, the last two films, because you know, Before Midnight that with Ethan and Julie kind of was about that, you know, the 18 year, a trilogy over 18 years with all this time in between. And then this is, kind of a bigger movie about time. So I've had to think about that a lot the last two years. And I think if I had to analyze it, I kind of have used time as a structuring device, maybe, kind of in place of um, traditional plot, mm -hmm. you know? Like that's kind of phony to me to a large degree. A lot of that's you know, kind of created. Mm -hmm. Whereas time is something we can all relate to. It's, it's kind of the, the way we process the world, the way we think. What, how we go through life, and so much of what I'm trying to do is kind of capture the, how it feels, mm. you know? So I was really trying to not tell a story about childhood so much as what it feels like to grow up, and in this case, what it feels like to be a parent, mm. too, to try to figure that out. So it's just kind of more the feel. So time for me works in that. You know, cinema has a very special relation with time mm. that I think is very fertile for you know, new forms and things. And did you two, you two have worked a lot together. Mm -hmm. I think last night you said, how, how many films is it? Eight. And I think also last night you quoted. Never again. Yeah. <laughs> this was the last oh, one. <laughs> I've been carrying him. For... <laughs> but didn't you quote in New York Times, the critic last night and how Richard sort of impacted well, I, I quoted the great Manola Dargis. Who, who, who really, you know, said it best when she said, um, this is our second collaboration together. She said, Richard Linkletter achieves the impossible or seems to achieve the impossible. Yeah, I don't think I can. He, he didn't quite get there. <laughs> well, wait, here's the question. He makes Ethan Hawke bearable. <laughs> that has been my goal. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and while I'll give her that was a major accomplishment, um, I One actually think biggest. he's done some yeah. other things, too. <laughs> Boy. Not even likable. Like it's just, not even he's bearable. Just like, like, a, a like it took the off room. the toxicity. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, well, yeah, so I was bearable. <laughs> even then. And you had worked on Before Sunrise and when boy, the idea of boyhood came around. We'd done Before yeah. Sunrise, um, Waking Life, Newton Boys. Newton Boys. Mm -hmm. Had we done tape before we started? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we'd done tape. We'd shot tape. Yeah. Kind of a real time mm -hmm. you know, movie, speaking of time. Mm -hmm. We did this film in real time. And then I approached Ethan with this idea. He was the first person I talked to mm -hmm. once this kind of movie hit me. I was like, and what about shooting it over? You know, here's what it would be, mm -hmm. and you got this really weird look on his face. And Ethan's like, "Cool, yeah, I want to do, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, just immediately. This is how we work. You know, he's just like, yeah, just think of it. You know, so mm -hmm. we were sort of off to the races. And were you? A, you were a father at that time. Were you a father? We both you were. You were a father as well. Yeah. So at that point, we each had one. 
Yeah. One and kid. It was so so fun yeah. for me because to end up, you know, that was the inception. It it was still. I remember during that conversation, the idea was such a yeah it was. Uh, embryonic. Mm -hmm. But the um, but a little bit later, you cast Lorelai, who's not here tonight. Lorelai plays Samantha in the movie that um, Eller's sister and um, which is Richard's daughter, who was one of the most magic things about making the movie was I remember our first workshop yeah. of Before Sunrise, seeing this little baby come yeah, see, into the room. Not even a year old. Not yeah. even a year old. And I was, I was about, was I 23 or 24 mm -hmm. something? Three. And I'm looking at, I'm look, and I kind of was looking at you and thinking, wow, you got a baby. Oh, you look at that today. Yeah, wow. What do you do with this? What do you do with wow. it? What yeah. do you do when it cries? Think, you know, it seemed like I think I was still asking that one. Idea. And, 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 <laughs> and then to actually get to play scenes with this young woman and, and, even you know, cross that boundary of uh, of sexuality and yeah. and dealing with all the kind of messiness of life um, that the movie tries to touch and feel. Um, it's just one of the great experiences of my life to get to do it. I mean, and it, we got to know each other later, you know. But I mean, I really do think that Lorelai is uh, an unsung hero in that the whole creativity mm -hmm. of this because. Of her relationship to you, which you, you couldn't really know, but you, we all know when you get kids together, Lorelai, because she was Richard's daughter, had a tremendous amount of confidence mm -hmm. on the set, which then she had grown you, up on movie sets yeah, too. It, so. it, it brought out your natural competitor, like, well, if she's gonna be funny, I'm gonna be funny. Yeah. You, you know the way the kids are, like, well, if you're gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, it's I, I how, got a better idea. <laughs> how quickly they got that sibling, even yeah. though at that time they're both it's only really children, fun. they immediately were, you know. Yeah, both on stream and yeah. just well, people. And so much was contingent upon finding the right boy for boyhood. That was the only real thing we were, we were casting for. <laughs> only really thing, because it was like Ethan, and then I, I called Patricia up, and we <laughs> talked, and she kind of came aboard. And um, Lorelai sort of cast herself as the mm -hmm. <laughs> older, older mm -hmm. sister. And then it was like, okay, who's going to play? Kid, and you when know. you determine to, you obviously have a penchant for people born in Texas, like all three people on the stage. So it was, a, were you thinking it's got to be from Austin? Well, his first thought was George Bush, but he was a little old. <laughs> <laughs> he was born in Connecticut. That's right, Connecticut. We don't claim. out. We yeah. don't claim. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, well, there were some very practical reasons. And, you know, Lorelai, being my daughter, I knew where she would be every year. I mean, this was a volatile enough mm. idea. We were tempting fate enough 12 years that, you know, the nightmare scenario is they move away or they want to quit or, you know, anything can happen in, in that kind of time. So I also, I really thought him being local or proximity to me in the production would mean a lot. Mm. And just the way we could rehearse and talk throughout the year and, you know, kind of keep tabs on one another and just, it was going to be about that process of growing and I wanted to, him to be kind of close. And so really, it's the kid, but it's his family. I knew they had kind of deep roots in the community. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't feel like they were moving to Australia in three years. They could have, but, um, you know, they didn't. So it was a huge, it was the biggest casting. Everything about this film was so weird, but that was kind of the weirdest, to be looking at an actor going, well, because usually you're casting, like, are you, are you the right person for this role that we will in the next couple months, you know? Uh -huh. But this was like, well, who are you going to be in 10 years? Yeah, could get gnarly. When do you ever get to do that in yeah. this world? You know, so it was like, it was like finding the next Dalai Lama or something. Where <laughs> you're just kind of like, well, how many... little man, is this yours from, you know, we were, <laughs> no, but we really just, we, we, we talked a lot. Mm. And he told great stories and he loved As movies. a six-year-old? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was unlike any other six-year-old. He, he was already watching R-rated movies and his music taste was, you know, that of a really cool, like, 14 or 15-year-old. What, what were your music tastes as a six-year-old? <laughs> um, and I think, like, Pink Floyd and uh, Radiohead. We, and Rage Against the Machine. Ra yeah, too. yeah, I guess it was more like <laughs> His dad's heavy musician. metal at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah we I unearthed it. Became interview. less angry as I got older. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we unearthed an interview we did, kind of a making of from year one. We hadn't seen it in all these years, and we saw it about six months ago. You both watched it? Yeah, and it was... Thanks for showing it to me. I was asking. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't in the first episode. Yeah, so. yeah, all right, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it was... I was standing next to you as you watched it, your little 
you know, seven-year-old self at that time talking about the movie and what it was going to be and what your relationship was like with your sister in the movie and what you were listening to. And that's, that was really funny to hear. Okay. But he was, he, he had like, his jeans were torn. He was just too cool for like the, we had teenager. to make him very is dorky. That a, is that because you grew up in Austin? Like, how did you get yeah, to be so cool like at six? he was like a hipster <laughs> Austin musician dude at seven, <laughs> you know. He was too cool for his character. And as but was my daughter in a certain Children way. of insane musicians. Or, or insane. Yeah. Special oh, breed. I know, they were, neither one was a normal child. Uh, but you know, all joking aside about all that, um, from my position in the, you know, organization or whatever it is, I knew in an ancillary way, you know, here I was living in New York and here in Wicklow, I, I found him, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really basically felt immediately, well, that's the decision you made that the whole thing rests on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that there's a certain bit that the movie could handle when the kids were young, that there's a certain, all children are beautiful. You know, they, they really are, and so it's all okay. The big thing was who Eller evolved into a, as a young man. You know, not to talk about you in the third person, but it was a really beautiful, it was a beautiful, mm -hmm. that young kid who was into Rage Against the Machine and with the cutoff jeans, when he turned 12 or 13, he started having something to say about art and about storytelling and about your own life. And you, you two understood each other. In a, in a nonverbal and a verbal way that made uh, the filmmaking extremely easy. Eller is that too? I mean, it was never, mm -hmm. it was, it was, I always found it, that, and by easy, I don't mean that it's not hard, but I mean, when things are right, they seem to fall into place. You know, sometimes no matter how hard you work, you can't get something to work. Something's just mm -hmm. off. And you two um, understood each other, and it was, the, for me, the reason why we're here talking about it, the way that we are and we're, we've, is, is because that risk and that gamble in your guys' relationship is what lands the film. It's what it elevates it out of a kind of a gimmick mm. um, or it, it, it becomes a story because it's about your evolution and you were able to do that. And I don't, that's the greatest blessing the movie ever had. Sure was. And did you know, I mean, Very as a six-year-old, did you have even any, did you know who these guys were, or did you have any concept of, I'm going to be growing up on screen? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I had, I, uh, I mean, I knew who they were as much as, you, like, the idea of, like, what a, like, famous, like, movie person is, is pretty abstract when you're six, and also the idea of 12 years is pretty abstract when you're six. <laughs> Twice your life. Um, <laughs> the next 12 years is, like, hard to wrap my head around now. But as a six-year-old, it's pure fantasy. Um, but I mean, I think I understood as much as I could. You know, I yeah. had been around a lot of like weird art projects, and so it sort of made sense. Yeah, <laughs> you were excited about it. And yeah, Eller would yeah, never waver. People always ask, like, "Oh, well, did you? Was that year you wanted to quit, or did you ever?" Yeah, he, he was always ready. Mm -hmm. Just call up, hey, let's go have lunch. Let's talk about you know next year's thing or what we're doing. And he was just always there. Mr. Consistency, always excited, always mm -hmm. bringing everything he Did had. Did he bike over to his year. house sometimes? Like you guys sort of hung out? <laughs> yeah, we'd hang out a little bit. And it got, as he got he would older, have lunch. Yeah, he would call up and say, Hey, I'm thinking about getting an earring. Would that be okay for my character? You know, like I was, <laughs> things like say? that. He was just always very conscious of. Did you let him get an earring? Yeah, I let him get an <laughs> He's not my kid. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I think I did preface it. What is that? What guys your age are doing? Is that is that going to work in the movie? It's like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> That's not out of the norm because you know. And I understand to sort of foster a sense of intimacy. You spent a weekend with Patricia, right? You and Lorelai, and you guys sort of yeah, hung out. yeah. She kind the first of weekend, yeah. took us took us out to the pool and like did arts and crafts with us and you know, established that maternal relationship. And did you? Patricia's a very hell natural. of a mom. She is, yeah, Patricia, like, yeah, she is a maternal force. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there's a clip showing her as a maternal force. So why don't we, mm -hmm. if we could see the first clip, Patricia as maternal force, it's not seeing the clip. <laughs> mm, if we could see that, that would be great. Do you still love dad? I still love your father, but that doesn't mean it was healthy for us to stay together. 
What if after we move, he's trying to find us and he can't? Well, that won't be a problem. He can call Grandma and she'll tell him. He can call information. We won't be hard to find. Is he still in Alaska? No, well, that's what your uncle says. I like him in polar bears or something. Yeah, well, I hope they're taming him. <laughs> <laughs> that was year one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was crazy. We were figuring out how we uh, Yeah, I think it was like four in the morning when we yeah. shot that. Um, Is that legal that was, for a six year old? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. They were saying shut it down. The producer was like, oh, we can't. Because like, it was so ambitious every year, we usually had about three days to shoot. And it, mm. You know, it was hard to contain in one year, like first grade, or the mentality of a seven-year-old. They had a year to think about that every year. But it's just so ambitious, so much material. So, yeah, we, it was late. But again, Trooper <laughs> found his energy and was there, you know. My mom was telling me that she remembers, like, an argument about exactly that, <laughs> the legality <laughs> of that, and Rick just being like, well, why make a movie? And <laughs> she was like, yeah. <laughs> My mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the difference. Instead of my kid needs his night's sleep, Genevieve, an artist, both his parents were like artists. They were like, "Here, yeah. drink some more herbs. You can." Yeah. Eat <laughs> You'll be glad you You're did. What's one yet. night in your life? You'll, you'll catch up sleep tomorrow. You know? But uh, we were sort of. I felt like we were casting the parents. Mm. I mean, you are. They're making a family decision. You know, you can't have a six or seven year old make a big decision like this. It was the 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 parents were you know, coming aboard, too, in a, in a big way. And I always hoped this would just be a fun thing in his life all these years. So. And Ethan, were you and Patricia involved in, like, naming the characters, the kids, and figuring out your names? Like, how did you arrive at that? Well, one of the things that Rick does that um, is so exciting for an actor, I mean, you know, you, you just spoke about kind of uh, exchanging time for plot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of what makes acting so difficult in most movies is that you're asked to carry this artifice of plot. You know, like our lives don't really have a beginning, middle, and end in some clear narrative sense, the way that most movies ask. You know, um, most relationships don't work that way. And so there's always this inherent lie in everything you're doing. And you're always asked to say, it's, it's what makes acting on TV bad. It's not that the actors are bad or, you know, like an episode of Matlock or something, you know, like <laughs> it's hard to do well because you've got to say, well, Matlock, if we don't get the car started by 8.15, the school will blow up. Come on, Matlock. Oh, I happen to have the key. You know, I mean, whatever it is you've got to make up. It, it's, you don't, it's not about the character. Yeah, it's exposition it's as ex dialogue. As dialogue. It's hard to and, do, yeah. And what Rick does is he, he strips the act. We, we don't have any of that responsibility. You know, so we actually can be human beings, mm. which is such an exciting uh, opportunity. And I've said this before, but it, it's a, you often hear people say, like, oh, this director really has vision or something. And I think what has separated and spoiled me as somebody who's gotten to work with Rick a bunch and was really so important to me as a young person and you do this naturally. I don't think it's an intellectual decision, but and I, I have the hope that, that this is something that you'll carry with this too, is that on Before Sunrise, Rick asked Julie and I to have vision. Well, what do you want the movie to be? You know, When this is over, this won't be my film. This ideally will be our film. What do you want it to be? Do you think that's smart? Do you not think that's smart? You know, and in doing so, what happens is the actor invests themselves in the movie, and they're not then trying to sell some other person's. They're invested in making it work themselves because it's important and true to them. Mm -hmm. So you get the thing that Kazan used to talk about of putting something real on screen or on stage, you know, something real that's worth your money or your time. Mm -hmm. That's not a lie, that's not a fake. And in little things, I remember um, on, uh, before sunrise, you saying to Julia and I, what should our characters' names be? Nobody ever asked me that before. And it's this weird, tiny bit of agency. Oh my God, I want my character to be named Jesse. And then you're like, that's me. And this whole thing starts happening. And I'm not sure I'm right, but I think you guys picked the names and I was forced to take the dads, the senior. Didn't, did, how did it work with names? I know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I 
think Mason came out of that first year. Yeah, and then, and then, then I just got what, handed it. So we, yeah, <laughs> I got screwed on this. No one. agency on this yeah. one. No, but I loved it. But, and um, it's it's there's so Mason many ways Senior. in Rick yeah. the way, and I love the name, and so I don't really remember. I know no. that. I know that there was dialogue about it mm -hmm. and that I was involved in it. And it is this, it's a subtle thing. Cause what is, what's in a name, really, right? Patricia's no. not even called by her name until several years in. Yeah, right. Yeah, she's the mom. There, yeah. We had decided. In the script, I it was that mom and dad. Yeah. Like, much right. When you're a little kid, on. you don't even know what your parents named you. I know, you know what they do for a living? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like. <laughs> my kids think, it's so funny, my kids think everybody's parent is in movies and stuff. I mean, they just. Why would like, they be? They, yeah. I remember I see hearing my son say, "What? What? what um, I've never seen your dad on the magazine cover." <laughs> oh no! Yeah. Oh no! What, what magazine says you? Yeah. And I had to explain him. That, that's kind of yeah. unique. To, that's it's, unique to our family. Oh, why? <laughs> You've been on a bunch. Yeah, yeah but you, you know. people who grow up like in the White House, or you yeah. know, they always go, "Yeah, you just—it's that perspective. It's so fascinating as a kid. Like that's all you know. What the world is." Kept from you, you just you just don't know, and I kind of wanted the film to feel like that, just widening of perspective, mm -hmm. like the film is so much from his perspective. But yeah, it's like oh, the whole world's not like this. You know, that's just how you feel. And how much did you have? You guys have agency in creating the storyline as it went forward, and how much did you have a vision of where it would go? Mm -hmm. well, kind of the basis of it all. I always was felt we had a really strong architecture to the piece. You know, I just knew. It was a DNA to the whole thing. Yeah, and that was, it was easy for me because it was kind of like my own childhood I was examining. Um, and my parents and. From the base. All, all that, yeah. So much of that is, is you know, autobiographical. Mm -hmm. But I, it's not specifically because I knew it would be, you know, mixing it through my cast and in the contemporary setting and it wasn't that extraordinary, you know, kind of like the movie itself. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, these are my parents and this is my life, but let's just start there mm -hmm. and bring, bring more to it. And Ethan and I found out our dads both, you know, kind of were in the insurance industry and what they did. So we like, it's yeah. funny, we'd known each other so long yeah, already never and really, we'd never really talked about that. Yeah, they had that. almost a similar job and like, well, let's head that direction, you know, mm -hmm. let's, mm -hmm. let's have them go there. And, Patricia and my mom were very similar. They'd gone back to school and um, had kind of... Well, Patricia's mom and your mom, not Patricia. Yeah, right? Patricia's yeah, mom. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Um, yeah, there were a lot of similarities there. And, uh, you know, you just start there and you just kind of... It, the whole thing was just an exploration of that, of parents. And for us, I mean, we had all been kids and then we were current parents and then we had our own parents. So mm -hmm. it was this cross-generational kind of exploration that was really, you know, that was something to explore for and 12 years. And then we always got to bounce it off Lorelai and Ellen. Yeah, these and what kids they were, were interested coming up. in and what spoke yeah. to them. So, so did that conversation, was that continually happening like around the same time every year right before you're about oh, to yeah. go I mean, kind of throughout the year. Constant. Yeah, yeah. and it was the end of one year, it'd be, okay, next year, this is what's happening. But it might be a vague outline, like there's a camping trip, you come and pick them up and let's do we that, know for a while. And we, you know, and then... What we are we going to talk about on the camping trip? I don't know. What about this? What, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then we'd, I would come in with it's ideas like, about, I remember that whole thing with Lorelai about sexuality and stuff. Yeah, it's like, it was actually it, in a, there was an article in the New York Times that yeah. kind of blew me away about how our country is, has the highest rates of teen pregnancy and things because we're, we're so Victorian in our ability to talk yeah, about like sex. abstinence only and, crap, you know, yeah, it never yeah, works. And, and so, so I thought, well, I should try as a, and, and I was sharing, we like, talking to Rick about, yes, yeah, should I try year. to, you know, and I yeah. tried to use the scene to talk about it with my own daughter. I'm working on this scene in which they talk about Sweden is very open yeah. about sex. Mm -mm. And, but anyway. And knowing Lorelai, you know, working with your own daughter so well, she, at that year she was so absolutely like repulsed by any notion of anything. Like, yeah, you to mentioned do with the, the body. word condom, her whole body. Would, and like, I knew, oh. like, hey, let's, we're going to, film her first because the reaction will be very real. But you had to have the sex, yeah. did, like, so you were, uh, conceivably had the sex talk well, with her first. Well, she had it years earlier. Conceivably? Yeah. No, she, she wasn't, she knew all the, the facts very early. It was just <laughs> related to her body and hearing it was, nah, 
Yeah. Especially hearing it, it from a, me. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, she associates who, us together you know. her whole life. Yeah. And looking back now, when you first saw the film, when did you first see it in its completed state? Uh, How, what was your reaction? About a month before Sundance, I guess. Um, I, don't, I wept for like two days. <laughs> um, it was a lot to take it. <laughs> I didn't but hear from him for a while. I, uh, I yeah, Rick was like, hey, you should take this and watch it alone. It's going to be intense. And it, it was intense. What um, was it about? What was the intensity? What was? I don't know. I mean, I think the way we age is something, and the way you change over time is something that you, know, you spend your whole life kind of wondering about and trying to put your finger on. And you know, you can look at pictures, but it's entirely different to see it like this. And uh, I don't know, it was just kind of an overflowing of emotions. Um, I've seen it like a dozen times now, and I just this last time I watched it was the first time in months. And it's the first time I've been able to like see Mason as a character and not like this weird warped version of myself, um, which is great. It's much less stressful that way. <laughs> I knew we were putting, particularly, you know, Eller and Lorelai in a really unique position. I don't think an actor's ever been in. I, people have been documented, I guess, in documentaries and things like that over time. But in a narrative piece where, you know, it's it's a fictional character, but it is a representation of them mm -hmm. through through all these years. I knew that would be a pretty big thing to to take in. But I, over the years, I thought, well, at least they'll be kind of young adult. They'll mm -hmm. have a maybe a mentality to, to absorb it by that, by that time. Mm -hmm. But so, they didn't watch it as we, as we went along. Yeah. The wonderful thing about it, I mean, there's a lot of things that are hard about it, and I don't want to yeah. undermine that. But there is one thing that's really wonderful about it is that acting can be a very powerful tool to see yourself as a protagonist. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what do I, they teach acting in jails and things like that is to help people. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's why they teach it in schools. It's the value of doing plays and telling stories and acting things out. We, not just the audience, the, doing it. You, you, you see the agency a character has. And you, it's as simple as when you watch a character on stage lie, the audience doesn't like it. They don't like that character. It's, 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 it's like, you know, it's, it's automatic. And it, there's all these powerful ways in which it works. And the only thing that's dangerous about it um, is really the public aspect of it. And what they had, see, what, why did my first movie, for example, with River Phoenix, so this is very um, relevant to me. It's, it's real, it's not a, a philosophy or something. It's, it is very, very hard. The movie I did after um, Explorers with River Phoenix was Stand By Me, and he was jettisoned to fame at 14. You know, it's an incredible performance. Yeah. If you ever see Stand By Me again, he is a beautiful, beautiful actor. And, but he was in the cover of People magazine and blah, 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 blah. And, and there's this isolation that you start to feel when people objectify and judge you, even if it's positive. I mean, there's obvious downsides to negativity. Mm -hmm. But positivity is hard, too, because people start seeing you as something other. And what I was so happy for you two is you got all these, the, there was a certain beauty in watching you, particularly in the later years, understanding your own life through art, you know? And that's what I do with my work with Rick, and, and that's, it's been a really healing, wonderful aspect of my life. Now, the danger is now. The hardest thing is now. And making the movie was so fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all felt a kind of sadness about it ending, yeah. the creativity of that, um, not knowing what's gonna happen next being a, a public thing of which it can be bought a ticket for and, and, and the great beauty of the movie, the thing that, and you, don't, you can't know this, but you know, I've made a lot of movies and a lot of times people don't care, mm. you, you know? And, and it's a really wonderful feeling in a way to walk down the street and have somebody walk up to you and say, I love that. But when they really love it, it becomes theirs. Mm. It's, it's, this movie belongs to other people. It's not ours anymore, you know? And that's a, it's a hard thing to give away, you know, whether it's writing or music or whatever, it's a piece of you. If it's real, if it's good, it's a piece of you and you have to let it go. And it's very hard, it's very hard. You must feel, have felt protective towards the kids as well. Like you kind of knew 
if this worked, mm -hmm. that at the other end of it, they were going to be exposed in a way. I, I remember a year or two before kind of preparing you, I don't know if you remember, the, the opposite. Like, this means a lot to us. We've put in this all these years. <laughs> Uh, this, I, is the, this would have been really hard. I yeah. asked you to say, here, tell me what this movie's about. And you started trying to describe it, and I just like, hold it right there. The reason, that's why no one's ever going to see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. you can't, it's hard to, you know what, a guy grows up, not much happens, you know, just don't, <laughs> don't, this is for us. It was but, about lowering expectations. But yeah, I was like, you know, I've done a lot of movies that you put everything into it, and you know, distribution is really iffy in the indie world. Just don't expect anything. <laughs> you know, I was going that way because there's a lot of anticipation, like, oh, maybe yeah, people my biggest will like fear it was or not something. That it would go well. Is that what yeah, it no, I was kind of preparing them for the other side. I didn't really anticipate that the, the concept of the movie itself would be a hook. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that had Or never just the emotion of seeing line. it. I yeah, mean, yeah, that's like what is almost the sucker punch. Like, yeah. you, you yeah. know as it's unfolding on screen, you, you understand what's happening, but something visceral happens at the end when you realize you've watched this man completely come of age, this young man. Well, that was the idea, that it would have this cumulative effect, mm. but still, you can't, can't really count on people being able to see it or it all working out, but we've been fortunate that way with good distribution and great response and all that, yeah. And speaking of distribution, you had IFC on board from the very beginning. How did you, Before how did that pitch meeting go? Like, how did you? <laughs> I think we were, I had done two films with them in the, and that came out in 2001, Tape, the one Ethan referred to. And Waking Life. And Waking Life. And IFC had, um, was involved in both of those. Mm. So, um, you know, I talked to them about it. Just kind of threw out it's the idea. It's a funny idea. meeting, though. Imagine saying, okay, there's no script. It's going to star a six-year-old who we can't contract to do the movie because it would be illegal to ask him to do yeah. something. But I'm sure I'll find somebody great. And give me and money, but you won't see any of it for, what, 13 years? 13 years. And, it, it, and it's going to be a quilt, a pastiche of all moments that would have been cut out of any other movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, my hat is totally off to Jonathan Searing. Yeah. You know? He's the... Uh, He's, he's the guy that... Head of IFC He's the productions. only guy besides Rick that I really think without whom this movie wouldn't exist. You know, I mean, all... Yeah. all he's a really... I had, I had talked to a few other, you know, producer-type people who had, had money and seemed, you know, young enough that they might jump aboard. <laughs> and, uh, oh, that's right. And, uh, <laughs> and they were like, it's a great idea. Like, they got it the mm -hmm. way, you know, the actors and artists kind of went, oh, cool, a way to tell a story. But they were just, they couldn't wrap their head around the money thing. Mm -hmm. I just, it doesn't make any, you know, no assurances. It was just too many risks involved. But I think IFC, you know, because of their environment, that, you know, they have a big library of films. They were producing, we were doing this very low budget, mm -hmm. you know. And I think they just were thinking long term and gave us that opportunity. So I was, every year we were very, very, you know, grateful that we got to keep going. And I wouldn't have necessarily predicted that they would have been a constant, you know, mm -hmm. companies get bought, sold, you know, all that. But, you know, they're kind of a part of a big, you know, operation. So very lucky. The same people there at the very end distributing the movie. It was kind of a great, you know, full, full cycle, you know, wonderful experience with them. And can you talk a little bit about the actual production of the film? Like, was there a plan? Well, I know the the word plan, I use that, usually, use that loosely, but we're going to meet for a week, a year, around March. Like, was that sort of yeah, the idea? Was it like hurting it sound cat? like it's one year, like same time next year or something. And then the movie would always be that. seasonal. It was much more, you know, one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, well, what is the next scene? Oh, what time of year would that take place? Mm. And then it was, okay, is it, you know, seasonal dependent? Um, and then it was logistically just, you mm. know, can't Kathleen, take the kids to a baseball game. Kathleen December, Sutherland, you know. you know, my producer. It just as soon as we mm -hmm. ended, I think we gave ourselves a month or two of a window of, okay. And then it was like, okay, well. What's next? Well, you know, what's the schedule looking like for this year? Mm -hmm. Oh, Patricia's on her show, and you're doing a film, and what's Ethan? Oh, Ethan's doing a play, and then he's, you know, so it was always mm -hmm. just trying to find when we could get the, those few days. So, But, you know, it was a, everybody was very committed. We were all in. 
Yeah. And it only got more committed, I think, for all of us. Yeah. It just got more exciting. Because, you know, in the beginning, it really did feel like an experiment. You know, I'd go down to Austin and shoot a scene, and people say, well, uh, oh, when's that movie come out? I said, in 11 years. <laughs> and, and, and it sounds so weird. But, but then once we'd done it for six, seven, yeah. eight years, mm. we got really excited about, well, this is, you know, and you could, we started to feel the, Yeah, it's the, really happening. Yeah, it became real. And then I started looking forward more and more. Um, to it and wanting to schedule your life around it mm -hmm. yeah. you know, these couple days. You know it's working and you're totally in love and committed to it when I said, hey, Ethan, if I get you know, hit by that bus, you have to finish this thing. You know, like if... <laughs> well, that was the risk, right? Like someone yeah. dies. Well, it's a risk in life. Yeah. Right. I mean, you never even mention that, but it's the a phone risk could ring here tonight, or, you know, you know, it's like people always ask, like, well, yeah, what if someone died? What if... And I'm like, well, if I got that call... It would be like, I hope my first thought wouldn't be about the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. You know, directors were kind of screwed up. But um, uh, It's a great thing where Coppola's like, uh, Martin Sheen's not dead till I say he's, he's dead. Yeah, yeah, he's not had a heart attack till yeah. I... Yeah. Um, but yeah, sure, you can look at the future with fear and risk assessment and, you know, like, oh, bad case scenarios, but... This was kind of the, the unknown future was like our fun mm. wild card collaborator. You know, that was like, wow, there's all these things. We don't know what's going to happen, but isn't that going to be cool when we get there and mm. we're just going to assess the landscape, not only of our own lives, but the culture. Mm. You know, like I remember presidential elections as a kid and when the Obama election of 08 was going on, I said, yeah, I wanted to pick that. Even if he doesn't win, we shot that before the election. Oh, right. But I was like, even if he doesn't win, I think I would... To me, the whole film was like a memory, and it was like, what would you remember? Because mm. for me, it was, I remember the elections as a kid. And you don't really have politics as a kid, but you remember who your parents are for. You, I remember neighbors. Right, and you were planting, you were getting people to swap yeah. out their lawns. Well, so the fun about that while we were doing that, you know, we had no idea who would win. So it was a weird, yeah. almost time travel thing. We were making a period film, a period yeah. film in the present, but it would yeah. become a, it was yeah. very strange. But it was, you know, making a period film and thinking, I did that with, with the technology. It's like, okay, this iMac, the, I said, that's definitely going away at some point. <laughs> so I remember like, let's shoot a profile of that. You know, it's like, like technology really would demarcate mm. the time kind of more than anything. Didn't your daughter want out? Can, didn't she want to be killed off at one point? <laughs> It was, it was a brief moment. <laughs> and I don't think she would have said it if her dad wasn't the director. I mean, her relation to this film is very different than, like, Eller's. Mm. I mean, she kind of came in casually as my daughter. She, you know, it just was not a big deal to her. Mm. And I think there was one year she wasn't really feeling it. It was the Harry Potter year. Um, she didn't want to dress. I, I always thought it's like she didn't want to play that character. McGonagall, I think we dressed her up as. She, I thought it was like Harry Potter specific, like that. But she just w kind of was it not in the so mood. So much that to year. do with her call time. Probably. You know, that, you know, <laughs> well, I actually yeah. found out years later what it what it really was. But uh, at that year, yeah, it was a very innocent. But she did kind of go, you know, hey, Dad, can my character this year? Yeah, man, can my character like die? <laughs> just kind, <I>, you know, <laughs> like no, you know, it's like that's a little dramatic for what the films. <laughs> how do we? No, you got to, you know. So I felt. But she got back with it. Mm -hmm. You know, she was immediately, she actually had fun that year. And pretty soon she was asking, hey, when are we filming? You mm -hmm. know, when are we, you know, so she, I'm proud of her. She worked really hard. That was just a funny little moment. What was her reason? Moment. You know, I found out years later when we went to Harry Potter land in London, you know, with the studios where they filmed Harry Potter are now this tremendous uh, museum. And, uh, you know, it's, you can go see the sets and how they did everything. It's pretty amazing. Even as a director, I'm going, that's how they did that? Oh, cool. You know? So um, I found out finally that I think Harry Potter was so real to her at that age that her dad making a film, you know, using it, the book signing, the book release midnight parties that they had was kind of, was breaking the spell. Like, I think mm -hmm. she thought she was going to get a letter from Hogwarts and, you know, <laughs> Mary Harry Potter, not Daniel Radcliffe, like Harry Potter. <laughs> you know, it was like she was in, you know, kid fantasy mm. land or something. So it was, it was brief. But yeah, I found out years later, like, oh, that's what was bugging me. Mm. It was me kind of, her dad sort of, you know, ruining that for her. It's kind of sweet, you know. <laughs> Did you ever, ever want out? I guess you could, you were kind of a linchpin, <laughs> not that anyone else wasn't, but. 
Uh, no, I mean it. Um, yeah, I could have ruined it if I had. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't even. If I had really the movie, like, wanted to. The last couple of years, you really could have said, "Hey, you know, I need a new car." You know. <laughs> <laughs> and Ethan, how much did you, being a father, sort of inform, or did that, you know, your lessons from fatherhood play into, oh, you know, well, how you were of, parenting in the film? Part of why I, I don't know this. But uh, part of why Rick wanted to invite me to be a part of this project was because we have a similar viewpoint about, you know, we mentioned about our own fathers, but we're both going through that, you know, Lorelai's ahead of um, Maya, my oldest, but fatherhood and in, in navigating that landscape is one of the most interesting things to ever happen to me. And mm -hmm. for us to have a, a forum to have that dialogue together and to try to create some art out of that. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know, but I just know I, I wouldn't have been the right person for the part if I wasn't a father. Mm. Yeah, you, you, I wouldn't you have know. approached Ethan. And even while we were making this film between Patricia, you, and myself, well, we had, had a bunch had more five kids. more kids, yeah. you know, mm. you know, so. Somebody that parenting didn't take thing to just class. went up to another level. So yeah, that was an ongoing thing. But it was very important. That's why I approached Patricia. She had been a young parent. Mm -hmm. I, I just I'd only met her once. I loved her as an actor, you know. But mm -hmm. I thought, oh, she's going to have a lot mm -hmm. of deep, you know, ideas about being a single mom and you know what that was like, you know. So. And in terms of how your character was a parent, was that something that you guys? that he wrote the lines, you guys wrote the lines, or was it a little bit more collaborative? Well, you work with kids. Well, you have to understand, too, he and we wrote before sunset and before midnight while we were working on this together. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so we were collaborating on a lot of different levels at the same time. Um, and so part of all our jobs, Rick would come to, it's kind of like this, I, it's hard to explain, but when you're involved in it, it, it made a lot of sense. It's kind of like Rick had the, the sheet music was all written out. Um, there's this elaborate sheet music and the melody was all arranged and this is where the, you know, the bass would come in and this is where the rhythm, he really understood the music of the movie. The lyrics, as it were, and I'd say this is, is, was true of Before Sunrise too when we first worked together. The architecture was in place and the lyrics he wanted all of us to come up with and be a part of. And it wasn't like, Patricia uses a great word, I think, for it, is Rick curates the movie. You know, oh, we would all have these long talks about where, you know, Mason Jr. might be in his life. And well, and they would say, well, what's it like? There's a great, one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie is this one that we have walking through the woods where I say, you know, are you dating somebody? And he says, yeah, kind of. And I said, well, have you kissed her? And he goes, well, not really. And he's are you dating somebody? I'm like, well, not really. He goes, have you kissed her? I'm like, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's really, but that all, we worked on that really hard, but we yeah. worked on it all together. It's not like Rick came to us with, this is, yeah. this is, it's like, there, it's Rick couldn't have written, word. you know, some of the ways that, it's the thing that reminds me of the same way Peter Weir approached Dead Poet Society. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful way of filmmaking. He came to us as young people, and he said, I don't want this movie to be nostalgic, like some old man's view yeah. of this beatific childhood. Mm. I want to feel what it's like to be a young man. Mm. And Rick was saying the same thing to Eller. What's mm. going on in your life? And then, so Eller would say it, and you know, Rick would say, well, that's, that's not this movie. This, is, this movie wants this. And, and we would, it was kind of like sanding something. Mm. You know, he'd come to us with an idea of a baseball game and maybe talking about Roger Clemens' ERA. And we'd, you know, <laughs> It was so fun, you know, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like any yeah. other project. Mm. It was fun to include Eller in that, you know, as he got older, it's like, hey, you know, you're going to meet a girl next year and that's going to, you know, so. So did you have to like meet a girl in real life? Like, how did that work? <laughs> yeah, so you better, you better get then. on that. I was just, I was just like, yeah, step up there. Um, I, I was just saying, <laughs> hey. Take notes, you know. I don't yeah. want to be some middle-aged guy writing a teenage scene. I want it to be real and come to me with, you know, 
st real conversation, some stuff you might have actually said in that situation. Is that what he, so. is that what he told yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the next time you're alone with a, with someone, like, write it down. <laughs> you don't have to write it Afterwards. down then. You can write yeah, it down in later. Your, my memory, you have you memory. Know, I'm not, like, transcribing yeah, my life I help as you to it be happens. writing it while she's, yeah. yeah. But, no. <laughs> you have the most beautiful eyes, and what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wanted it to feel that, and I think that, I love that scene, too, that, that is in the movie when you first meet you know, Sheena's character, because it, it does feel real, and you do reveal, you know, a lot about yourself there in a, in a way, where, you, where you're at. You're kind of vulnerable there, you know, so it was very important to the movie at that moment. Mm. And did that come from you writing down? So much of it, yeah. It did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that monologue was, and the kind of the Facebook rant were very much, oh. like, <laughs> my, uh, kind of, it's great when, like, pseudo philosophy. Yeah, when we're like, that's good. Seventeen-year-old, you know, just the film required it at a lot of times. But it's like, yeah, you, you had to be coming into your own. These are your ideas, and it was great to have that outlet I mean, mm -hmm. to kind of take all this bullshit that's in your head. At, I mean, always, but especially when you're seventeen, and have a way to kind of look at it through. Uh, objectively, you know, through a fictional lens. And when you started the film, you were six. Had, had you done acting seven, before, yeah. or seven? When we were shooting. You were shooting, uh, you were a seven-year-old pretending to be six, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> well, was the at the end of first part. grade, what are you, six, seven, you know, you're in there. Had you seven. acted before, had you? Mm -hmm. A little, a, so? tiny, a tiny bit. A ton, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did, mean, I did a lot of like theater classes and stuff when I was really young, but I, I think I had had one like part with no dialogue in a movie in Texas. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know there was no dialogue in it. <laughs> I think I maybe a, a shouted, colleague of mine had worked on it Daddy. and actually <laughs> recommended him. Mm. You know, so I was looking for actors. I didn't want to just scoop some kid off the street. You know, I wanted it to be that would indicate family support and and all that, so I wanted to find a kid who already kind of had their hat in the ring mm -hmm. as an actor to, to some degree, so. And he had been recommended, they said, oh, he was cool and you know, good to work with. Mm -hmm. That meant something, mm -hmm. you know, but he, I still met a ton of people. Yeah, but, I was gonna ask, how many kids did you meet before finding out? I don't even remember, just a lot, mm -hmm. a lot. It was, you know, like I said earlier, it's just such a big decision, so many ways to go, so many, so many different kinds of people, mm. you know, so I just thought, you know, LA was in a way the most like sensitive and thoughtful, you know, and I think you know, he was talking so much about like music and movies and I thought, oh, he's kind of an artist. Mm -hmm. He's going to be an artist of some kind, I felt. Or, you know, you meet the jock kid, the student council president kid, you know, if you had to make some wild prediction about someone's future, but, um, you know, kids are especially kid actors, they, they often, um, they can be kind of cute and people pleasing and, you know, Ellery really didn't care what you thought about him. He was just <laughs> who he was. Mm. He was very just honest and had none of that, didn't really, you know, so I said, oh, that's good. Very you know, realistic and real, mm. real kid. Mm. You know, so. Why don't we see another clip now? It's um, the bumpers, life, it's oh, the yeah. second clip. Let them know who you are, buddy. Let them know who you are. Um, yes! 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 All right. All right, don't worry about it. Looks like you use the bumpers. Bumpers are for kids. You know, what are you, two years old? You don't want the bumpers. Life doesn't give you bumpers. There we, there we go. There we go. We got something there. We got something. We got something. Oh! Last time we were bowling, we had bumpers, and it was a lot more fun. You don't want the bumpers, all right? You bowl a strike with the bumpers, and it doesn't mean anything. Trust me. Just lay it out on the lane. One, two, three, and... Bumper Cheer for the father! Boom! Get up, 
he has a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yeah, at that point, he's been out of their lives, and he kind of comes in and is trying a little too hard, or you know, when your son's been away from you, you're going to enforce all that you know, masculinity or whatever. <laughs> And were you naturally throwing it into the gutter as a... I'm a terrible bowler. You are. <laughs> <laughs> what precedes that clip is Lorelai actually bowling a strike. nails a strike, <laughs> you know. And so it, it always felt that way as a sibling. You just can't, the younger sibling, you just can't compete. And you're obviously a natural bowler. <laughs> it, um, that took um, all day, actually, to get you to, <laughs> you know. I was, I was semi-pro. Uh, yeah, we... Yeah. Um, um, we did that no, in CGI and post. The funnest, so. <laughs> <laughs> the best, one of my favorite moments in the movie for me is, happens just after this is the father's been a little MIA for over a year, um, apparently in Alaska trying to write songs and, and things like that. And, and after, after we were done bowling, we're sitting around talking and um, the kids ask me where I've been. And my character says, well, you know, I'm sure you know this, but your mother's really a piece of work, you know. And he's about to launch into a, his justifiable story about why mm -hmm. things transpired the way they've been. And there's just this, it just cuts to, to Eller and Lorelai, and these big eyes looking, and you kind of cut back to me, you realize that there really is no appropriate answer to that question. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that it's really, are you going to show up or aren't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it can make up some story if you want, and it may even be true to you. It may even be real, but for kids, and that in a real way, that's the beginning of, of Mason Sr.'s journey, which is this meeting that responsibility, mm -hmm. and that in meeting that responsibility, uh, something's got to give. You know, everybody loves this idea of, you know, follow your dreams, but a lot of times, if you really follow your dreams, it comes at a great expense. And, and adults have to wrestle with that all the time. Mm -hmm. At what point, at what priority to place their own personal dreams? Um, and to, to what priority do you place meeting your responsibilities? You know, and this is a, the story from Mason Senior's point of view is a story that starts here about, you know, right after that he says, hey look, I'm sorry about the bumpers deal, yeah. you know, I'm gonna try to do better. Right. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be around more often. And you, it, it takes, you know, your life doesn't just change in a decision. One of the, the, the journey for me was trying to make all his transition from this kind of ne'er-do-well, GTO driving, aspiring musician who thinks it's okay to disappear for a year in Alaska to a responsible father who's driving a minivan and has a job in an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And how <laughs> to make that transition seem inevitable. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of the things that I always feel about life is that you hit these crisis moments in your life and you feel like there's a big decision to be made and if you know you, you're up all night you don't know should I go left should I go right every in a few years it happens and when you look back it seems so obvious that you're always going to go left you know and you think oh why did I you almost don't even remember that you stayed mm -hmm. up all night mm -hmm. making that decision it seems inevitable yeah. and so my hope is that because we always knew that by the end the GTO would be gone and there'd be a minivan or some form of what a minivan would be in the future and and Minivan. And a minivan. And, <laughs> Nothing changed uh, in the physical uh, world. <laughs> and, but that I wanted it, by the time that happened, to seem just totally natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we thought we were making this portrait of a, a dad who really loves his kids and is trying so hard. And mom, it's more obvious, you know, she, but to, people were like, ne'er-do-well dad, deadbeat dad. Uh, yeah. well, well, you, people want to project so much negativity on the we're so judgmental of parents all yeah, the time. Yeah, deadbeat. I said, well, is there any way in the film that we show that he's not paying child support? Mm. Do we know he's the fault of the divorce? Mm -hmm. we, the film doesn't, that's all off screen. We have no idea. Because, again, that's the kid's perspective. I had no idea why my parents got divorced. I just knew his dad moved out. You know, like, you know, so they, don't, I, they keep that knowledge from you because mm. you're too young to maybe it's grasp or they don't, don't want you. Want you don't know. Know. I didn't even want to know. Yeah. And that's the point. But, From my point of view, Mason Sr., I think he had a real story. I think he really wanted her to come to Alaska. He really wanted the kids to visit, and she wouldn't answer his letters. And just, yeah, we, we don't know, know what happened. You don't get to, but what you realize when you look at those kids' eyes is they don't give a Right. <laughs> yeah. What the reason is, are you going to be there for me or not? Mm -hmm. Because whatever the reasons are, they didn't work for me. Yeah. You, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the thing that you have to learn as a parent, you, you know, is that is this accountability that, and these years are passing, you know? If you're, 
They go fast. Yeah, it's the guy who makes the decision. Mm -hmm. you know, he and he makes decision. it right there at the bowling. Yeah. And he really is determined to like get into his kid's life. There's another clip about you, you know, trying to engage your kids, and the kids are sort of giving you these monosyllabic answers. Talk to me. Samantha, how was your week? Uh, I don't know, Dad, it was kind of tough. Billy and Ellen broke up, and Ellen's kind of mad at me because she saw me talking to Billy in the cafeteria. And you remember that sculpture I was working on? Well, it was a unicorn, and the horn broke off, so now it's a zebra, okay? But I still think I'm going to get an egg. Mason, uh, how was your week? Well, Dad, you know I was kind of tough. Joe, he's kind of a jerk. Actually, he stole some cigarettes from his mom. He wanted me to smoke them. But I said no, because I knew what a hard time you had quitting smoking, Dad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that <comes after> <laughs> Was there kind of, I mean, is that how, you know, are you, do you engage with your kids like that? Did your oh, father with parents had that scene, we know, but Some I mean, if you see that. more of that scene, it's just they don't, they don't talk, you're trying to drag it out of them, yeah. but they don't want to relate to you. And how that scene continues on is that, you know, and this is what came out of improvs yeah. with Lorelai and Eller, Who was them saying, well, what back. about your life? Tell me, you know, what do you yeah. mean? Uh, tell me, who are you dating? Yeah, you know, you? And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. It's like, <laughs> okay, so we'll just skip. Mm. Thank you guys and for working here yeah. tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for all, all your thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.